Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor James Corthals. It's my privilege to be here with you this morning. From the beginning of time, God has set aside rest for his people. He established the Sabbath day as a time where, where people would remember that they find their rest in God alone. In the scripture lessons this morning, we're reminded that we too find our rest in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We'll be following the order of service, the service of the word as you find it printed in your worship folder this morning. May God bless our worship as we begin with the singing of our first hymn, hymn 397, Just As I Am Without One Plea. Please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins by the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Since that time when the Israelites had fallen into sin by making and worshiping golden, a golden calf, the Lord had refused to go with his people. Now Moses comes and pleads with the Lord, asking the Lord for his help and the Lord responds by going with them. Our first lesson from Exodus chapter 33. Moses said to the Lord, Look, you yourself have been telling me, Lead this people up, but, we have not, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. So now, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways so that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider that this nation is your people. The Lord said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Moses said to him, If your presence is not going to go with me, do not send us up from here. After all, how would people know that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Isn't it in this way that you go with us so that we are distinguished, I and your people, from all the people who are on the face of the earth? The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have said, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Please show me your glory. The Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord in your presence. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. 
He said, you cannot see my face, for no human may see me and live. The Lord also said, look, there is a place next to me where you shall stand on the rock. It will happen that while my glory passes by, I will put you in a crevice in the rock. I will cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you will see my back, but my face you will not see. The word of our Lord. We turn now to the psalm of the day, Psalm 62. We find it on page 88 in the front of your hymnal. We join in singing the psalm together. The Christian life is a battle, a battle between our sinful flesh and the new man born at the time of our baptism. When we find where we can find rest from that battle, well, St. Paul reminds us where we can find rest. We find our rest in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our second lesson from Romans chapter 7. For I do not understand what I am doing because I do not keep doing what I want. Instead, I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. But now it is no longer I who am doing it, but it is sin living in me. Indeed, I know that good does not live in me, that is, in my sinful flesh. The desire to do good is present with me, but I am not able to carry it out. So I fail to do the good I want to do. Instead, the evil I do not want to do, that is what I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who am doing it, but it is sin living in me. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is present with me. I certainly delight in God's law according to my inner self. But I see a different law at work in my members, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me captive to the law of sin, which is present in my members. 
What a miserable wretch I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of our Lord. We join in reciting the verse of the day. Alleluia. Happy are they who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with patience. Alleluia. Please stand for our gospel. Previously, Jesus had warned the people about the coming judgment, but many had rejected him and failed to repent. Now Jesus turns to those who are following after him and reminding them of the truth that they have been given through him. For Jesus has come to remove the burden of sin from us. Our gospel lesson from Matthew chapter 11. At that time, Jesus continued, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from clever and learned people and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, because this was pleasing to you. Everything has been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wants to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 416, How Firm a Foundation.
May grace and mercy and peace be multiplied in your lives through the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word for our consideration this morning is recorded in the Old Testament book of the prophet Amos, the fifth chapter, where we read, Seek the Lord and live, or he will rush upon the house of Joseph like fire. The fire will consume, and no one will extinguish it for Bethel. There are some who turn justice into wormwood, who throw righteousness to the ground. There are those who hate an arbiter in the city gate. They despise anyone who speaks honestly. That is why you trample on the poor and you collect taxes on their grain. You have built houses of cut stones, but you will not live in them. You have planted choice vineyards, but you will not drink their wine. For I know that your rebellious deeds are many and your sins are numerous, you who are enemies of a righteous man, you who take bribes. They thrust away needy people in the city gate. That is why a prudent man will be silent in that time, because it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, so that you may live, and then it will be like this for you. The Lord, the God of armies, will be with you as you claim. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of our Lord. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who continues to invite us to come to him and has promised to bless us, dear Christian friends. It is the middle of the afternoon. It's a Saturday, and you're at home. You wander out into the kitchen, and, and you open up one of the cupboard doors, and you look at its contents. A few minutes later, your spouse and another member of the family come into the kitchen and they see you standing there with, with sort of a blank look upon your face. And they ask you, what are you looking for? Well, truth be told, you don't know what you're looking for. You know that you're hungry. Maybe you think that you want something sweet or something salty. Or maybe it is that, that you think you want something chewy or something crunchy. Well, there in front of you are, are several options, but not a single one of them jumps out at you as the thing which is going to satisfy your craving. What are you looking for? That's the question which we can ask ourselves and all the people around us, especially those who are restless and those are looking for something, something different than what they presently have. In answer to that question, some may say, well, I'm looking for happiness or I'm looking for excitement or, or I'm looking for love. Or maybe they would say to us, I'm looking for the meaning of life. I'm looking for an escape. Well, as it so happens, we all are looking for something. But the fact is, we're not going to find the answer in those things that I've just mentioned. Oh, yeah, they, they may please us for a little while, but that's it. God has created us for something. God has created us to give us something and not the kinds of things that, that we just mentioned. This morning, the Lord speaks to us through the Old Testament prophet Amos. Amos lived about 750 years before the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And already at his time, God's Old Testament people had, div- <coughs> had divided into two kingdoms. <coughs> the kingdom of Judah to the south, the kingdom of Israel to the north. Now, these two were different. The kingdom of Israel was better off politically and economically. Israel was richer than Judah. And as a result, the people were enjoying a prosperous time. But that prosperity wasn't enjoyed by everyone. It seemed that the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poor. Oftentimes, the rich and the well-to-do people, <clears throat> they had taken advantage of others. And as a result, they were forgetting about the needs of other people. Yes, the, the rich and the well-to-do people They were not concerned about the poor or the widows or the orphans. And to make matters worse, even the priests and the kings weren't all that concerned about the poor. Yes, it was a bad time. God's people during this time had fallen away from him. And as a result, God was going to try to bring them back. Yes, the the Lord was trying to show the people mercy, but they refused to change their ways. And it showed that they had some deep spiritual problems. Yes, these people who were building the fine homes planting the luxurious orchards and gardens. They were oftentimes doing that at the expense of the other people. They were taking advantage of others so that they might have good things. And Amos doesn't mince any words. He brings it to their attention, the specific things of which they're guilty, when he says, There are some who turn justice into wormwood, who throw righteousness to the ground. There are those who hate an arbiter in the city gate. They despise anyone who speaks honestly. That is why you trample on the poor and you collect taxes on their grain. The rich and the well-to-do people They were burdening the people with unfair taxes. And when the people complained, when when they took their case before the judges, they found that the rich oftentimes bribed the judges to do what they wanted. Yes, God's people had lost their way. And those who were complaining, they became bitter because it seemed as if no one cared about them. It was, they were so bitter that it was almost as if it, like they were chewing on, on wormwood. They were frustrated because no one was coming to help them. But God knows that there's a day of judgment coming. And through Amos the prophet, points out to them that that judgment is on the way. He says, you have built houses of cut stone, but you will not live in them. You have planted choice vineyards, but you will not drink their wine. Just think of it, they went through all the work to build those wonderful, luxurious homes, but they weren't going to be able to enjoy them. They had taken the time and put in the effort to build those vineyards and gardens, and they never were going to be able to harvest the fruits. For within a generation, 
God's judgment was going to fall upon these people. Yes, God was going to send the Assyrians to come in and destroy that kingdom. Many people would be killed. Many others would be carried off to captivity far, far away. Can we say that our world today, or even our own country, is immune to these kinds of problems? Isn't it true that there are still those who want to lord it over others? Who who want to take advantage of others for their own benefit? They want to become rich by taking away from other people by manipulating things to their advantage. At times, they may ally themselves with other people in order to get what they want. And if that doesn't work, they may try to get rid of those who stand in their way and are a barrier to the things that they want. Oh, it's not surprising then that that today there are still people who are frustrated And in their frustration, they abandon God because they think God has forgotten about them. But my friends, God has not forgotten about us. God himself is seeking so much more for us than even we might want for ourselves. Therefore, Amos doesn't simply point out the judgment that is going to be coming, but at the same time, he also holds before the people the rest and the love that God wants them to have. For through the prophet, the Lord says, Seek me and live. Seek the Lord and live. Seek good and not evil that you may live. God's prophet is calling upon the people to change their ways. And and what a gracious promise God holds out to them. He says, yes, they are guilty of sin. But there is a Lord who is merciful and willing to forgive them. He he invites his people to come to him, uh, to look to him as they repent of their sins and call upon the Lord for his help. But it's sad that so many people didn't listen to what the Lord said to them. And within a few years, exactly what the Lord had said would happen would take place. The kingdom would be destroyed and the people would be carried off. The lesson is clear. Rejecting the Lord means that we turn away from the one who is able to keep all the promises that he has given to us. It's not surprising then that in the book of Proverbs we're told righteousness lifts up a nation But sin brings shame to a people. Without God and left to our own desires, we we too want all of those thousands of good things that the world has in store for us. But only one thing is really needful. There's only one thing that gives us exactly what we need, and that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not a new thought. For Jesus came to give us life, real life, abundant life, eternal life. And long before Amos spoke these words, Moses had told God's people, Love the Lord your God, for he is your life and length of days. And in John's gospel, we're told, 
This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Jesus himself tells us, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. As we listen to Amos calling people to repent of their sins, maybe we self-righteously think to ourselves, yeah, those Israelites, they had it coming. They were only getting the punishment that they so richly deserved. But then if we stop and think for a moment, we realize that we find ourselves in much the same situation. Oh, may, maybe we're, we're not doing exactly what they did, some of those gross outward sins that they were guilty of. But it's so easy to slip into others. If it's not deeds that we're doing, it's the thoughts that we have that aren't in line with what God wants or the words that we speak which aren't to the benefit of anyone. And Jesus himself re reminds us of the danger when he says, out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, sexual sins, thefts, false testimonies, and blasphemies. And yet the Lord is merciful to us. God loves us. Even when we did not seek God, God came looking for us. That's why he sent our Savior, Jesus, into this world. For, for Jesus, as true God, is the one who made life, the one who created life, the one who gives us life. Just think of Jesus' public ministry with acts of love and mercy and healing. Jesus was constantly showing people who he was and the love that he had for them. And what was their response? Well, many of them simply rejected him. And in the end, the people were responsible for putting him on the cross. But thanks to a gracious God, that the Lord who gives us life has also destroyed death. For when Jesus rose from the dead, he also reminded us that he has taken care of our sins and that he has provided for us not only life now, but life for all eternity. And he constantly reminds us of that love through the announcement of the forgiveness of our sins, Jesus reminds us of what he did. Through the, the gospel message, that simple, beautiful gospel message of all that Jesus did on our behalf, we know that God has completed his mission of mercy. And when we come before his altar to receive the sacrament of his body and blood, in a very special way, the Lord is coming to each of us saying, this has been done for you, for the forgiveness of your sins and for life. Our Lord came to us not to give us what we deserved, but he came to us to give us exactly what we need. He gives us the forgiveness of sins. He gives us eternal life. And having found life in our God, then we turn and we look at the people around us in a different way. We, we recognize that the other people around us, they are also people whom God loves. People whom we are to love people to whom God has also shown mercy. Not people to manipulate, not people to abuse, but people to whom we are to reflect the love of God. 
If you would read to the end of the book of Amos, you would find that Amos also holds out to the people hope. Hope that is to be found in the Messiah, our Savior, Jesus Christ. God will seek his people. God will find his people. And God will save his people. So, what is it that you are looking for? Unfortunately, too often, we don't know exactly what it is that we are looking for. But God has come to us. God has revealed himself to us through his word so that we might know our Savior Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us. But it doesn't end there. You see, once we know who Jesus is, we have the privilege of letting other people know that that same Savior is their Savior too. For the Lord says to us, just as he said through the prophet, seek the Lord and live. For it's in Jesus that we find life now and for all eternity. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, keep our hearts and minds through faith in our Savior Jesus. Amen. At this time, I'd ask you to stand as we join in confessing our faith, using as our confession this morning the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, union of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. There are a number of special prayers of intercession before us this morning. There are a number of people experiencing health challenges. Barry Weirs, Lucy Hesselberg, Phyllis Berg, and Lois Spoor. There are also a number of anniversaries being celebrated. Ross and Michaela Cago, Wayne and Deborah Garvis, and Brian and Ann Berg. And finally, there are a number of birthdays as well. Michael Melker, Monica Chipiski, Neil Williams, Stephen Holtzhausen, Carol Hoyer, uh, Barry Weirs, Peggy Meyer, and Breeze Bunker. We'll be using the prayer of the church as you find it in your worship folder this morning. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptation of the devil, 
the world and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Precious Savior, bring your rest and comfort to the hearts of all who are faced with health battles. As they face their challenges, Lord, we pray you give their bodies healing and their souls assurance of your grace. Everlasting King, make your presence known in the lives of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Help them rejoice in the many ways you've blessed their lives through the power of your word. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the singing of hymn 358, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds.
Please stand for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in love and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We join in singing our closing hymn, hymn 422, Jesus Lead Us On. Once again, good morning. good morning. There are a number of announcements which uh, Pastor Groth wanted me to underline this morning. 
First of all, the quarterly voters meeting is next Sunday after the second service, about 11.15 a.m. Uh, St. Paul's will be manning the county fair booth on Wednesday, July 19th at, at 5 p.m. Come help if you can, and school supply donations can be dropped off in the narthex. You'll notice there's a, a box back there for that. You can find more in the news and announcements. May God bless your week, and please greet one another.